Good afternoon, Dr. Norton here with the Celestial Railroad. Now this is, uh, as you know, another Nathaniel Hawthorne short story. We start out, let's, let's, let's just jump in here with a, with a sample. Uh, the Celestial Railroad starts this way. Not a great while ago, passing through the gate of dreams, I visited that reason, region of the earth in which lies the famous city of destruction. It interested me much to learn that by the public spirit of some of the inhabitants, a railroad had, has recently been established between this populous and flourishing town and the celestial city. Having little time upon my hands, I resolved to gratify a liberal curiosity by making a trip thither. Accordingly, one fine morning after paying my bill at the hotel and directing the porter to stow my luggage behind a coach, I took my seat in the vehicle and set out for the station house. It was my good fortune to enjoy the company of a gentleman, one Mr. Smoothed Away, who, though he had never actually visited the Celestial City, yet seemed as well acquainted with its laws, customs, policy, and statistics as with those of the City of Destruction, of which he was a native townsman, being moreover a director of the Railroad Corporation and one of its largest stockholders. He had it in his power to give me all desirable information respecting that praiseworthy enterprise. So, Daniel Hawthorne's Celestial Railroad is what we call an allegory. And it's an allegory actually based on another text altogether, which is called John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress was written during the English Civil War in the 17th century. Nathaniel Hawthorne's text is written, as you know, in, in the middle of the 19th century. As an allegory, the, the nature of an allegory is pretty simple. Everything is symbolic, from the names to the transportation, forms of transportation, the very roads, all the characters' names, obviously. We, already in this very beginning, we have the City of Destruction, a symbolic city. The Celestial City, another symbolic nature of a city, right? Another city with a, with a symbolic nature, that is. Even the man he meets, Mr. Smooth It Away. You can read into that as well, symbolically. Um, what is the difference between an allegory and a regular short story with symbolism? Well, in an allegory, as I said, everything is symbolic. In a short story where symbolism is being used, not everything is symbolic. There are, is a use of symbolic you know, imagery. Um, but in this one, everything is symbolic. So that's, that's an important way to read the text. In this one, we have an interesting narrative structure. We have Hawthorne as author. We have a dreamer that Hawthorne has created to be basically our narrator. And, and that's our third level, which is the pilgrim narrator. So Hawthorne, then a dreamer, and then the dreamer who dreams about himself as a pilgrim. So those are a, a three, kind of a three-tier narrative structure. What do we know about this pilgrim? The pilgrim betrays a, a knowledge, a pretty good knowledge, of John Bunyan's novel, his very famous novel, The Pilgrim's Progress. He knows that story very well, and part of his journey is really to discover the different parts of that story. He has a record of the city, both the City of Destruction and uh, Vanity Fair, as well as the Celestial City. He knows about these places. He refers to the Bunyan text as an old story. And so in this way we have a sense of the passage of time that is indicated through the story and through the narration. This style of reference allows for a couple of tensions to, to arise very in the very beginning. A tension between the past and the present. A tension between tradition versus innovation. A tension between what is irrelevant and what is relevant. And then a tension between improvement and corruption. The pilgrim consistently refers to improvements and his references to quote unquote improvements must be understood, I believe, in an ironic way to read this text properly or at least to read the text in a way that Nathaniel Hawthorne would want us to read it, which is really only one way of reading a text, right? So if you look up page 135, again using Nathaniel Hawthorne's tales as our major text here, page 135, 
He writes this. The narrator says, This is a wonderful improvement indeed, said I. Yet I should have been glad of an opportunity to visit the Palace Beautiful and be introduced to the charming young ladies, Miss Prudence, Miss Piety, Miss Charity, and the rest, who have the kindness to entertain pilgrims there. Our modern pilgrim, the narrator here, is referring back to what he knows about these ladies from John Bunyan's text. In John Bunyan's text, these four ladies were beautiful and wonderful and very helpful encouragement, a source of great encouragement to um, John Bunyan's pilgrim, whose name was Christian. And this one, this again, the idea of improvement versus corruption, past versus present, irrelevant, relevant, tradition, innovation, and so forth. We have this response, which builds into the tension. Mr. Smooth It Away says, young ladies, <laughs> as soon as he could speak for laughing, and charming young ladies. Why, my dear fellow, they are old maids. Every soul of them, prim, starched, dry, and angular. And not one of them, I will venture to say, has altered so much as the fashion of her gown since the days of Christian's pilgrimage. So what is being valued? What is being disrespected, I suppose, alternately? Uh, what is being valued is, is what is relevant, right? I mean, these ladies, they're old maids. They still wear the same old clothes they used to wear. They haven't changed their style at all. They're outdated. What use are they? They look goofy. And they're not, they're not beautiful anymore, and they're not young for sure. So what is the value? The value is youth. The value is what is most present and relevant. This is what's being valued in this text, or at least what the, what the characters are, 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 are um, communicating as a value. Again, this builds into our greater attention, the past versus the present. And please, as I said before, we're, Nathaniel Hawthorne, that is, would have us read this in an ironic way. Let's see how it plays out. So the major character, again, we mentioned already, Mr. Smooth It Away. Mr. Smooth It Away, as I've already mentioned, um, is definitely a character who disregards the past. Thinks the past, anything archaic, anything old, even John Bunyan's old book, ah, it's what's most present, what's most relevant that matters. Mr. Smooth It Away is also another source of another tension, I would say, that being between knowledge and ignorance. Mr. Smooth It Away has uh, knowledge of the celestial city through hearsay. He is a, is a man who betrays some knowledge, but for the most part he is ignorant of how things truly are. And that is, that is shown to us later in the text. Mr. Smooth It Away, again, maybe perhaps showing a tension between truth and deception, truth and lies, um, and also a tension between rumor and stated fact. Mr. Smooth It Away depends upon rumor, not upon stated fact. Another character, Mr. Greatheart. Um, you know, for the most part, all of John Bunyan's heroes are marginalized in this text. In this, the new story, uh, John Bunyan's great heroes are marginalized. Uh, if you look on page 133, actually going back a page, the narrator says, Where is Mr. Greatheart? inquired I. Beyond a doubt, the directors have engaged that famous old champion to be chief engineer on the railroad. Now, what's interesting, in my text here, we have a, a subscript for Mr. Greatheart. It says, Mr. Greatheart guides, counsels, and defends Christian's wife on her journey to the Celestial City in the Pilgrim's Progress, the second part. This might be a good time to, to mention, in John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, in all the marginalia, the, all the stuff in the margins, there are references to biblical Bible verses. The Bible is what we call an intertextual authority in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Interestingly, we have Hawthorne kind of subverting that idea here in the Celestial City in an ironic way. Um, the intertextual voice is John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. We hear about John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the characters that are in that text. We hear about that in the text in an intertextual way, but instead of those references serving as an authoritative voice, those 
voices, the, the Pilgrim's Progress from John Bunyan is seen uh, in a different light, not as authoritative, but rather as archaic and old, and it's disrespected in many ways. That voice is disrespected. It's showing that text in an archaic way, it's outdated, and that is the intertextual usage of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress in the Celestial Railroad. So um, we have Nathaniel Hawthorne using a similar style of narrative, a similar use, a similar style of in intertextuality, but it's subverted. So John Bunyan employs the Bible as an intertextual authority. The Bible is an authoritative source in Bunyan's text. In Hawthorne, John Bunyan's text is subverted and disrespected, whereas the Bible is respected as an authority voice or authoritative voice in Bunyan's text. In this text, John Bunyan's text is used in an intertextual way, but it is disrespected. It's a bit of a, uh, a twist, but uh, hopefully that makes sense. So here, he continues, beyond a doubt, the directors have engaged that famous old champion to be chief engineer on the railroad. And the answer is, why no? This is where we see the marginalization of John Bunyan's characters. Why no, said Mr. Smoothed away with a dry cough. <laughs> he was offered the situation of brakeman, but to tell you the truth, our friend Greatheart has grown preposterously stiff and narrow in his old age. He has so often guided pilgrimage pilgrims over the road on foot that he considers it a sin to travel in any other fashion. Besides, the old fellow had entered so heartily into the ancient feud with Prince Belzebub that he would have been perpetually at blows or ill language with some of the prince's subjects, and thus have embroiled us anew. So on the whole, we were not sorry when honest Greatheart went off to the celestial city in a huff and left us at liberty to choose a more suitable and accommodating man. Yonder comes the engineer on the train. You will probably recognize him at once. And this will be Apollyon, which is an ironic switch. And so, what do we have here? Revealed about Mr. Greatheart, in, he obviously, as I said before, he's marginalized. But with this introduction, we have developments in the feud between heaven and hell. So, in this text, Again, building on the John Bunyan text. In the John Bunyan text, we have a feud between heaven and hell, things heavenly and things of hell, um, things of God and things of the devil. There is definitely a battle going on between good and evil. It's the same battle that was going on in John Bunyan's text that is continued into this text, but it is phrased in a different way. Uh, and we, we could say that it is phrased in a very, very more modern context. You know, I can't help but think of uh, C.S. Lewis, although C.S. Lewis came long after Nathaniel Hawthorne. That would be a, a, another cool text to, to study in, in a line, perhaps. If you read John Bunyan's text, The Pilgrim's Progress, and then you read Nathaniel Hawthorne's Celestial Railroad, and then perhaps you read C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. It would be kind of a cool study of influence. No doubt C.S. Lewis was familiar with Nathaniel Hawthorne's work in The Celestial City and very much knowledgeable of John Bunyan's the Pilgrim's Progress, because in C.S. Lewis's work, you have uh, a satanic figure, uh, Wormwood, I believe his name is, and he's coaching, I, I believe, I'm, I'm freewheeling here, but in that text you have the devil coaching, or a demon coaching his, his apprentice in how to deceive men and women. And, uh, and one of the ways that, that screw taper in that, in that text that, that C.S. Lewis writes, one of the ways that devil deceives modern men and women is by getting them to believe there is no devil. There is no satanic force. There is no evil truly. There is, uh, there is no real battle going on between good and evil. And that's one of the ways that, that Satan, in C.S. Lewis's text, deceives modern men and women. And so we have some of that same stuff going on here, right? With Mr. Smoother away. Ah, that ancient feud, he says, it's not, it's not really going on anymore, buddy. Just, what are, you, what are you thinking? I mean, that's kind of that's kind of old superstitions that people in the old days used to believe. It's not relevant anymore. Uh, we, we've given up on, on trusting the old books. We have the new stuff, innovative uh, books, books about new sciences and new developments. These, these are what matter today, not the old stories. Another, um, in terms of characters, uh, we have the walking pilgrims. The walking pilgrims were a key part of John Bunyan's text. 
you walked to the Celestial City. It was a long, arduous walk with many difficulties and obstacles, giant despair, and other characters that would, would definitely be enemies to your progress to the Celestial City. In this text, we have an introduction of a new character that builds on the old, which is the train passengers. And so on the train passengers, you see a 134. Um, it has this introduction to a new tension, in a sense, with this new set of characters, right? There were no train passengers. There was no train to the Celestial City in John Bunyan's text. But here it writes, here he writes, the passengers being all comfortably seated, we now rattled away merrily, accomplishing a greater distance in ten minutes than Christian probably trudged over in a day. It was laughable, while we glanced along, as it were, at the tail of a thunderbolt, to observe two dusty-footed travelers on the old pilgrim in the old pilgrim guides, with cockle shell and staff, their mystic rolls of parchment in their hands, and their intolerable burdens on their backs. The preposterous obstinacy of these honest people in persisting to groan and stumble along the difficult pathway, rather than taking a, rather than take advantage of modern improvements, excited great mirth among our wiser brotherhood. This is the train passengers are, are called wiser brotherhood. We greeted the two pilgrims with many pleasant jibes and a roar of laughter, whereupon they gazed at us with such woeful and absurdly compassionate visages that our merriment grew tenfold more obstreperous. Apollyon also entered heartily into the fun and contrived to flirt the smoke and flame of the engine or of his own breath into their faces and enveloped them in an atmosphere of scalding steam. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Burning someone with scalding steam. Hopefully you're reading the irony here, the humorous irony, right? These little practical jokes, little practical jokes, is that what burning someone with scalding steam is? These little practical jokes amused us mightily and doubtless afforded the pilgrims the gratification of considering themselves martyrs. All right, so the introduction of the new train passengers in contrast to the old archaic walking pilgrims. Oh, the gall of those old pilgrims thinking they were martyrs and intentionally suffering for the gospel or suffering for Christ. Interesting tension that is developed with new characters. Um, in another similar way, we have the people of Vanity Fair, past, and the people of Vanity Fair, present. Now what you see in this text, this section is very interesting, um, both humorous and troubling, this section about Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair is where, in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, a character named Faithful is where he was uh, arrested for no reason, actually Christian was arrested as well, he was arrested for no reason, or arrested um, actually for not buying anything, right? When they wanted him to buy something from the Celestial, for, from uh, Vanity Fair, they said, no, we're not going to buy anything, we're looking for truth, we only want truth. And they said, hey, you're trying to, to mess up our city, and for that, Faithful was hauled off into a criminal court, a kangaroo court really, and was eventually uh, convicted to death and he was burned at the stake. That's a very tragic moment in, in John Bunyan's text. Well, here it's kind of glossed over, right? Uh, the modern pilgrim loves Vanity Fair, finds it difficult, as he says, to write down all of his, his observances. On page 139 in my text, it says, uh, it would fill a volume in an age of pamphlets were I to record all my observations in this great capital of human business and pleasure. There was an unlimited range of society, the powerful, the wise, the witty, and the famous in every walk of life. Princes, presidents, poets, generals, artists, actors, and philanthropists, all making their own market at the fair, and deeming no price too exorbitant for such commodities as hit their fancy. It was well worth one's while, even if he had no idea of buying or selling, to loiter through the bazaars and observe the various sorts of traffic that were going forward. Our modern pilgrim loves it, but just can't get enough. He wants to talk and talk and write about all these observances, but man, it would just take a volume to write everything down, he says. 
Well, this is written in contrast to John Bunyan's text where Christian and faithful are walking through and, and, they, and, they, and he says in the text in John Bunyan's work, they don't even want to look. They don't even want to look at this stuff. It's so uh, offensive. It's so, uh, it's so awful what's going on in Vanity Fair. They don't want to look at it. It's just that offensive and they want to guard their eyes. So very much a different sense. The people of Vanity Fair in the past text um, and the people of Vanity Fair in the present text even the, the, the pilgrim's response to it, to Vanity Fair, a, a different and definitely set in contrast to the older text. Now, one of the, one of the other further tensions we see, I think it's worth mentioning as the, as the story moves forward, is the tension between what is substantial and what is temporal. Perhaps we might say eternal versus temporal as a better tension. So the conversation our pilgrim, our modern pilgrim has with the walking pilgrims in Vanity Fair points to the eternal nature or the more substantial nature of the walking pilgrim and the substance-less or fleeting nature of the train journey. Uh, we see this brought out in, on page 141 in a conversation that the walking pilgrim has with our modern pilgrim. He says to him, Sir, inquired he with a sad yet mild and kindly voice. Do you call yourself a pilgrim? Yes, I replied. My right to that appellation is indubitable. I am merely a sojourner here in Vanity Fair, being bound for the celestial city of the new railroad. Alas, friend, rejoined Mr. Stick to the Right, again, with our allegory uh, often the characters' names give away much when you're working with an allegory, and so stick to the right, stick to the right way, stick to the right path, uh, denotes some sense of uh, commitment, right, and, 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 um, and focus. Mr. Stick to the Right says, I do assure you and beseech you to receive the truth of my words, that the whole concern is a bubble. You may travel on it all your lifetime, were you to live a thousand years and yet never get beyond the limits of Vanity Fair, yea, though you should deem yourself entering the gates of the blessed city, it will be nothing but a miserable delusion. So we have this idea of the delusion, or as I mentioned before, things eternal versus things temporal, things sub substantive versus things that lack substance, like a bubble, that is, a, a, a soap bubble. And he says that, kind of building on that idea of the soap bottle on the, on the bottom of the, of the same page. There was one strange thing that troubled me, says our modern pilgrim. Amid the, preoccup amid the occupations or amusements of the fair, nothing was more common than for a person, whether at a feast, theater, or church, or trafficking for wealth and honors, or whatever he might be doing, and however unseasonable the interruption, suddenly to vanish like a soap bubble and be never more seen of his fellows. And so accustomed were the latter to such little accidents that they went on with their business as quietly as if nothing had happened. But it was otherwise with me. So an interesting tension there between what is substantive and what is fleeting or, or lacking of substance. What, what is substantive about the dirty focus, drive, and determination, determination of these walking pilgrims versus the, the speedy, substance-less journey of the train passengers, of this whole change in transportation we see, uh, this very interesting and, and um, complex tension developed by Hawthorne. What is the nature of walking versus riding? What is the nature of, of embracing? Or what is really behind modern technology? What is that really offering us? Is that all good? And again, that is another good connection with Minister's Black Veil, with uh, the birthmark as well. You know, we find this a similar interesting tension in the structure of the text as well. 
So we move from a, a more novel, although the novel wasn't officially born until after Bunyan. That, that's, that's a source of much tension among uh, critics and historians, but nonetheless, if we, if we want to call it Bunyan's very early novel or his text, his allegory, it's a longer text. And here we have a longer text made into a short story. I think that's an also, also worth mentioning. Uh, as a transition from things that take a little more work to get through, like John Bunyan's novel versus a short story. Plays into the, the theme of the text itself. We have walking versus riding, slow versus fast, easy versus difficult. The story can be read as a critique in, in other ways, a critique of Cartesian thought, is uh, my last point. Uh, in Cartesian thought, uh, that's Descartes, right? Uh, Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. The idea of truth beginning with self. The truth would begin with self is a Cartesian idea. It's an idea that Descartes really uh, promoted. This runs in contrast to a biblical or Christian sense of truth. The truth to the Christian, um, in the Christian worldview, truth begins with God. That is where truth begins and ends. Uh, again, that, that is why, in many ways, John Bunyan would use the Bible as an authoritative text in the Pilgrim's Progress. In the Celestial City, truth is self-referential. Truth has more to do with how I feel. What do I believe truth is? What is, what is best for me? And so those two things are in contrast in the text in a, in a, in a pretty interesting way. All right, let's move on. The birthmark. The primary tension in this short story, in the birthmark, is science versus religion. In some ways, we could see this as a new Adam and Eve story, a secularized Adam and Eve story. Um, there is no mention in the birthmark of religion or Christianity. There is a mention of things spiritual, but no sense of, or no mention of religion. And that's important. Because in many ways, this is, the story does not depict a rejection of religion. What we see, rather, is an allegiance to scientific power and progress. A love of science and a trust in science. And this kind of builds in 1850, really, 1850 was kind of the, toward the end or the latter part of the Industrial Revolution. But a lot of what Nathaniel Hawthorne does in, in many of his works is comment on the Industrial Revolution and the impact that ha that has had on men and women in their minds and what motivates them, their own, yeah, their psyche. But here we go. We have an allegiance to scientific power and progress. So let's take a look on page 118 in my text. It begins this way. In the latter part of the last century, there lived a man of science, an eminent proficient in every branch of natural philosophy, who not long before our story opens had made experience of a spiritual affinity more attractive than any chemical one. He had left his laboratory to the care of an assistant, cleared his fine countenance from the furnace smoke, washed the stain of acids from his fingers, and persuaded a beautiful woman to become his wife. In those days, when the comparatively recent discovery of electricity and other kindred mysteries of nature seemed to open paths into the region of miracle, it was not unusual for the love of science to rival the love of woman in its depth and absorbing energy. The higher intellect, the imagination, the spirit, and even the heart might all find their congenial element in pursuits which, as some of their ardent votaries believed, would ascend from one step of powerful intelligence to another until the philosopher should lay his hands on the secret of creative force and perhaps make new worlds for himself. In another way, that through science man can become perhaps like God. Although it's not said, right? God is not mentioned there, but he could make worlds of his own. That man could become a creating power himself. We know not whether Alamer possessed this degree of faith in man's ultimate control over nature. He had devoted himself, however, too unreservedly to scientific studies ever to be weaned from them by any second passion. His love for his young wife might prove the stronger of the two, but it could only be by intertwining itself with his love of science 
and uniting the strength of the latter on his own. So here we have faith in man's ultimate control over nature. We have love of science that is communicated here. We have faith in man's ultimate control over nature. This is a view of man as becoming more powerful through innovation, through technological advancements, through industrialization perhaps, ultimately through scientific discovery. That's where our story starts. And in this way, science takes on a religious tone with many key words. And actually, some of the ones I just read there were, were pretty good. Um, we have this idea of spiritual affinity. Uh, another key word here we have is uh, kindred mysteries, opening up to the paths or the region of miracle. We have this idea of higher intellect. I'm just reading through here. The spirit. Uh, ardent votaries. Again, uh, religious language. Again, the, the text doesn't seem anti-religion, which I think it, on Hawthorne's part, because obviously he, he works into religion, he works religion into many of his stories, and that's a very important part of his life and, and his outlook. But in many ways, he is intentionally avoiding this conversation with religion intentional, or with, with, with an intentional um, drive of religion. I, instead, he, he props up science as as having a religious power of its own. Um, other other um, references to this, on uh, page 119, the, the handprint on Georgiana's face is a crimson stain. The word crimson we, we see in, in scripture, in, in the Christian scriptures, uh, the crimson blood of Christ, a reference to the crimson blood of Christ. Uh, on 121, uh, we have references to, um, or actually it's um, Alimer's own statement. He says, um, noblest, dearest, tenderest wife, cried Alamer, rapturously. That's another good religious term. Doubt not my power. Uh, again, religious overtones. On 127. It is dangerous to read in a sorcerer's books, said he with a smile. This is Alamer. Though his countenance was uneasy and displeased, Georgiana, there are pages in that volume which I can scarcely glance over and keep my senses. Take heed, lest it prove as detrimental to you. Here we have Alimer talking about a book and, and seeing the words of this book as having power and authority. Another reference to religion, especially Christianity, right? We have where you have the word of God in the scriptures that are valued above all else, um, above, above most all else. Uh, this scripture is very important in the Christian religion. And so, in many ways, he's taking the sorcerer's books, his sorcerer's books, and elevating that to a, a higher level. The following statement was interesting as well, though. She says, she says in response, It has made me worship you more than ever. Again, the idea of worship. Christian or religious overtones. And then finally, the last one I'll mention here, and there's many other ones, but on 129... There needed no proof, said Georgiana quietly. Give me the goblet. I joyfully stake all upon your word. So the, the goblet, I mean, that could have been any, it could have been a cup of beaker, it could have been a vessel, it could, it could have been more of a scientific, uh, con, uh, a more of a scientific container, right? I, I never heard, I don't, I don't hear scientists talk about using goblets in the laboratory. You hear about them using beakers or or glass tubes or whatever, but here he uses the term goblet. Again, religious overtones. Um, also, she says, I joyfully stake all upon your word. The reference to the word, more uh, in, in a very Christian way, in, in Christian overtones. Sorry, we have Christian overtones here, um, referencing to the power and the authority of his word. I found an interesting article a while back from the New Atlantis, actually. You can probably find this online. The title of the article, Nathaniel Hawthorne and the Spirit of Science. It says this, Nathaniel Hawthorne's interest was scientific technique as a means of power and what people might want to do with that scientific power. Words such as symbol, type, and emblem appear throughout his work, Nathaniel Hawthorne's work, suggesting connections to eternal temptations. Several of his most famous stories depict fantastical potions that even now do not exist. Right, we have that here in the birthmark. 
but the aspirations driving their creation are as old as man. These stories envision powers we have always wanted, but n might not wisely know how to wield. That's an interesting statement here. I'll just pause. I'll read the last sentence in a moment. The stories of Nathaniel Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne's stories, in the birthmark, to have a potion that would take off a blemish of the skin? Yes, we definitely would love to have something like that. But the problem that, that Nathaniel Hawthorne sees with these potions is that mankind might not wisely know how to wield potions or powers of that kind. You know, this makes me think about is, uh, in, in our more contemporary sense, is uh, stem cell research. Now, stem cell research is driven by the desire to save lives, obviously. The problem is, the problem that I see, and, and you know, can't say uh, I know exactly all the ramifications behind stem cell research, but the problem people have that are thinking about stem cell research is what will men do with this type of technology? Who will lose? Now, part of the stem cell research thing is that lives will be taken or sacrificed for technology. Uh, perhaps babies in the womb will be, will be killed or sacrificed to take their stem cells and use it for other research. Um, it is what men will do, what women will do, what science will do with this power. Will we wisely know how to wield this power? That is the issue behind many technological advancements. Uh, even looking back at, uh, at history a bit to the development of the atom, the splitting of the atom. This is a great scientific development, an amazing development. But how was it used? It was used to murder, kill thousands and thousands of people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the atom bomb. And so how will man use this new technology? That is the issue, and that is what Nathaniel Hawthorne is attacking in this text and in many other ones as he looks at scientific development, at technological development. The, this selection of the article finishes with this statement. Others among his tales reveal the sphere in which technology has no dominion and how forgetful we are that it cannot help us there. So in this text where we have science elevated to the position of, or to the place of religion or having science embraced in a very religious kind of context or with religious language, science and technology are wonderful in, in many ways as long as they're understood to have a proper place. Once they're elevated outside of that place in, into another dominion, as the article says, we have, we have much greater problems. Another question to ask about uh, the birthmark is about the character Alamer. Is he a villain? That's kind of how we've set him up so far, right? A villain. This guy is not satisfied with a beautiful wife. He has a beautiful wife, Georgiana. Not satisfied with her. Is he a villain? Or is he a tragic hero? Alamer seeks to perfect humanity. He overlooks one of the most obvious human situations, and that is the impossibility of perfection. And to Hawthorne, um, this idea would be original sin. Alamer overlooks original sin. What does the birthmark actually symbolize? This is kind of moving on to that now. It may symbolize original sin. It may be a symbol of human imperfection. To Alamer, the mark is, this, as he says, the symbol of his wife's liability to sin, sorrow, decay, and death. Alamer refuses to recognize the deeper issue, human limitation and imperfection. The story can be read as a critique of the human failure to recognize sin and depravity, and to believe, uh, according to, to Hawthorne especially, this would be the danger of believing that evil is manageable. Another question, what is Georgiana's role? Is she an innocent person or is she an accomplice in this whole scientific worship, in the misplacing of science and technology? She makes a comment, several comments regarding this worship. Um, in 127, her own voice, Alamer claims, is will quench his spirit, the, the thirsting of his spirit. Her voice quenches his thirsty spirit in a very worshipful way. So he worshiping her, she worshiping him. On page 128, um, 
It says, her heart exulted while it trembled at his honorable love, so pure and lofty, that it would accept nothing less than perfection, nor miserably make itself contented with an earthier nature than he had dreamed of. She felt how much more precious was such a sentiment than the meaner kind, which would have borne with the imperfection for her sake, and have been guilty of treason to holy love by degrading its perfect idea to the level of the actual. And with her whole spirit, she prayed that for a single moment, she might satisfy his highest and deepest conception. Longer than one moment, she knew well it could not be, for his spirit was ever on the march ever ascending and ever, and each instant required something that was beyond the scope of the instant before. For a single moment she desires to satisfy Alamor. He is a godlike figure in her life. She's worshiping him and she's building into his sense of godlike power. Is she just an accomplice? Or has she, is she a victim of his manipulation? She talks about herself in 129. Save on your account, my dearest Alamer, observed his wife. I might wish to put off this birthmark of mortality by relinquishing mortality itself in preference to any other mode. Life is but a sad possession to those who have attained precisely the degree of moral advancement at which I stand. Were I weaker and blinder, it might be happiness. Were I stronger, it might be endured hopefully. But being what I find myself, methinks I am of all mortals most fit to die most fit to die. In some ways she's talking about ignorance being bliss here, but because she knows the truth, this is to be read ironically, right? She knows the truth that this must be removed. She knows the truth that science must advance and everything must be sacrificed for the sake of knowledge and development of, of humanity or human sciences. Everything must be sacrificed. This is the most noble way to proceed. On page 130, we have her final statement, literally, her final statement, that as she dies, she says, My poor Alamer, murmured she. Poor? He says. Nay, richest, happiest, most favored, exclaimed he, my peerless bride. It is successful. You are perfect. Then she writes, again, she says again, My poor Alamer, she repeated, with a more than humble tenderness, you have aimed loftily. You have done nobly. Do not repent that. With so high and pure a feeling, you have rejected the best that earth could offer. Alamer, dearest Alamer, I am dying. I don't see in any way, really, Georgiana saying, Alamer, you fool. You big fool. You big fat liar. That's not what, he, that's not what she's saying. She's saying, you've done nobly. You have sacrificed the best of what you have for what? For the advancement of science. And that is good. That is noble. You have done well. You've made a worthy sacrifice, Alamer. This is where I begin to see Georgiana as more of an accomplice than a victim. How is this relevant today? I think one of the contemporary cultural readings we could place on this thing uh, perhaps is our desire to perfect ourselves through plastic surgery. And this, out here in California where I live, plastic surgery is nearly the norm in many ways. We modify our shape and our size through science. And this is seen as, this is applauded. Is Alamer in that way to be considered a modern hero? I think so. All right, finally, Ethan Brand. We find Ethan Brand at a lime kiln. Actually, sorry, the story actually opens up at a lime kiln. At a lime kiln, the worker of a lime kiln heats limestone up to 1,517 degrees or so Fahrenheit. When the limestone is heated up to this temperature, the stone is calcified, and a powdery substance called quicklime or calcium oxide is produced or is taken out. That's what we want from a lime kiln. And quick lime is, is used to make many things. One of the key things is, is it's used to make cement. So what is the significance of the setting here next to a lime kiln? I think you could do a lot with this. 
I think one of the key things perhaps is the fact that Ethan Brand is a man who worked to transform um, stone into powder. That was his original work as a lime kiln man. That's when he returns to his original place of work. After he's done what? He left the lime kiln originally to go and seek the original sin, or the unpardonable, sorry, the unpardonable sin. He wanted to find out what that was. Before he did that, he was, he was a man that worked for the transformation of stone to powder. With the use of heat, he transformed substances. Now, as you know, heat is both a purifying agent and an agent of destruction. Depending upon what is in the substance, heat can either purify or destroy the substance that is heated. So Ethan Brand's quest to find the unpardonable sin. Now what he says later on in the text is that he, he really spent his life when he found the unpardonable sin or when he was searching for that, he, he used it to destroy lives. To perhaps, by his the heat of his temptation, to either destroy or purify. And I suppose in many ways we can see that from a Christian sense as temptation itself. Um, we see in scriptures, it says, Consider it all joy, my friends, and I'm paraphrasing here, when you encounter various trials, because the testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing of your faith, I suppose, can do two things. It can ruin you, it can destroy you, um, or it can help produce endurance. It can help increase the strength of your faith. So here on page 233, let's jump there. Two thirty-three. What? Then you are Ethan Brand himself, cried the lime burner in amazement. I am a newcomer here, as you say, and they call it eighteen years since you left the great, the foot of Greyhold, Greylock. But I can tell you, the good folks still talk about Ethan Brand in the village yonder, and what a strange errand took him away from his lime kiln. Well, and so you have found the unpardonable sin, he says. Even so, said the stranger calmly. If the question is a fair one, proceeded Bartram, where might it be? Ethan Brand laid his finger on his own heart. Here, replied he, and then, without mirth in his countenance, but as if moved by an involuntary recognition of the infinite absurdity of seeking throughout the world for what was the closest of all things to himself, and looking into every heart save his own, for what was hidden in no other breast, he broke into a laugh of scorn. It was the same slow, heavy laugh that had almost appalled the lime burner when it heralded the wayfarer's approach. Some interesting things are here. He found the impardonable sin in his own heart, in himself. Now in some ways we might, we might think of the minister's black veil here. What is meant by unpardonable? Forgiveness cannot be earned, right? So there's no way for a man to pardon himself. This could be part of where we're going with this, or part of where Hawthorne is going with this. You think of the black veil. If the man goes and looks for the unpardonable sin, is it, is it, for, is it the sin that he cannot be forgiven of, the fact, sorry, let me repeat that. As he searched for the unpardonable sin, is the search for the sin that he looks to be able to work toward forgiveness through? Is that what he's looking for? So the sin, he sees sin, and as he sees it in his own life, he's looking for a way to pardon himself. Is that what's going on here? The idea of pardoning one's self from sin. Because um, we see in the minister's black veil, the minister's black veil, in the in minister Hooper's light, he looks for and sees sin all around him, and thus puts the veil to cover his face as a symbol of that which is truly there. In the minister's black veil, the tension and the problem is the fact that people don't recognize, they're afraid to recognize their sin. And, and Hooper says, we can't go on lying to ourselves like this, we have a problem, and the problem is sin. In this text, though, there's a slightly different twist. 
this man goes looking for it, and he realizes it's right here. It's right there all the time. His own sin, his own heart is corrupted. And is he unpardonable because he is only looking for a way to pardon himself? Is that what we see Hawthorne setting up here? That this man will not be pardoned. He will not be pardoned because he will not seek to be pardoned by anyone else, only by himself. The laughter. Laughter in Hawthorne is always pretty significant. We saw laughter in Goodman Brown at the bonfire out in the middle of the woods. We see laughter in Major Molino, my, my, uh, my kinsman Major Molino, when Robin has it the very last moment of the text when he sees his kinsman and there's a turn of, of, of his heart, a changing of his, of his perspective, and he laughs. Is it a laugh recognizing the absurdity of life? The absurdity of his situation? His own helplessness? Minister Hooper. He laughs a similar laugh. Mr. Mr. Minister Hooper smiles a knowing smile. A, a smile that seems to recognize the absurdity of, of the human situation that is around him. Uh, the human disregard for that which is most dangerous. The human disregard for a situation that is so dangerous and so damning and so corrupting. And yet, a situation that so many fail to recognize and only want to cover up. On page 234, it says, He felt that the little fellow's presence, this is after Bartram sends off his son. They go get the guys from the village to come see Ethan Brand. And then he says this, He felt that the little fellow's presence, his son's presence, had been a barrier between his guest and himself. And he must now deal heart to heart with a man who, on his own confession, had committed the only crime for which heaven could afford no mercy. That crime, in his indistinct blackness, seemed to overshadow him. The lime burner's own sins rose up within him and made his memory riotous with a throng of evil shapes that asserted their kindred with the master sin, whatever it might be, which it was within the scope of man's corrupted nature to conceive and cherish. They were all of one family. They went to and fro between his breast and Ethan Brand's and carried dark greetings from one to the other. Again, another kind of connection, I think, with the minister's black veil here, an interesting one. Sin is held in deep regard here. This is what I find most interesting here. Sin is held in deep regard. What is the nature of sin and damnation? Is Hawthorne's text critiquing how we as humans have taken, perhaps, taken sin too lightly? Do we throw the term around like a simple fact of life? when in reality, it is a raging disease, the most dangerous and contemptible of all man's enemies. In many ways, what Hawthorne is doing in this text is raising the level of sin through this character, Ethan Brand. That sin in truth, once truly recognized, is terrifying. What is that corruption? What is that haunting reality, the brokenness of man? And when we face it, sin shudders up our spine, the most terrifying element of our existence. In many ways, we see Nathaniel Hawthorne working with this idea. On page 235, it says here, While the lime burner was struggling with the horror of these thoughts, Ethan Brand rose from the log and flung open the door of the kiln. The action was in such accordance with the idea in Bartram's mind that he almost expected to see the evil one issue forth, red hot from the raging furnace. Hold, hold, cried he, with a tremulous attempt to laugh, for he was ashamed of his fears, although, although they overmastered him. Don't, for mercy's sake, bring out your devil now. Man, sternly replied Ethan Brand, what need have I of the devil? I have left him behind me on my track. It is with such halfway sinners as you 
that he busies himself. Fear not, because I open the door. I do but act by old custom, and I am going to trim your fire like a lime burner, as I once was. He's going to trim his fire. He's going to what? Tr turn up the heat, basically. I'm going to turn up the heat, Ethan Brand says. And is this the nature of temptation? Is this what sin can do? Can turn up the heat in our lives? Again, going back to those two purposes we talked about before. Sin as a fire, as temptation as a fire that can burn you up. Temptation that can destroy your life. Or temptation that can harden you to virtue. That can harden you and make you all the more strong to endure the temptation as you see the destructive nature of sin do you turn and say oh man there's nothing in life worth worshiping as you see the destructive nature of sin obviously we see that as we look throughout history but hitler is a great example i think of the destructive nature of sin i've talked to many people who refer to hitler and they say that's why i don't believe in god because of hitler if there was a god in heaven wouldn't he do something about that? Wouldn't he have stopped the murder of so many Jews, the murder of so many innocent people? Perhaps. That's one way to look at it. And that would be sin in its destructive nature. Sin and temptation destroying our view of who God is. In a different way, we could look at, at, the, at, the, at the sin of, of Nazi Germany, the horrific nature of, of, of Hitler and what he desired to do and what he did in, in murdering so many. And we can say, that is, that is a raging beast, sin, that corrupted the mind of a man like Hitler. And all, all the more do we need to cling to God himself to save us, to lead us, and to empower us. Because if that exists in our lives, if sin like that truly exists, how much greater is our need for a salvation? How much greater is our need for God himself to intervene in our lives and to save us from that kind of sin? So in that way, sin has its dual aspect of two different things it can do. It can break you and crumble you before any kind of religious uh, belief. It can destroy any religious belief. Or it can purify and cut away anything uh, of, of, a, of a kind that would say, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm doing just fine in this world. Things are pretty good. Uh, that will be destroyed as you look at sin eye to eye, face to face, because things are not okay in our world as we see them. And so the second way again is looking at that sin and saying, "Wow, that kind of evil, that kind of depravity truly exists in our world. I need to do something about that. I need to protect myself. What is there? How can I be saved?" And we might find ourselves then looking to God to say, I can't do it on my own. This sin that I see in Hitler, it rages in me. As the line burner says, his own sin cried out to Ethan Brands and back and forth. His own sin is in me. I can't save myself. At best, all I can do is destroy others. Perhaps not in the same kind of Holocaust way that Hitler did, but in smaller ways that are, that are equally damaging. And so at that moment, we might cry out to God and say, no, I need to be... I need to be purified by your will, by your way, by your blood. On 235, I just read that part. Um, I'm going on. Bartram thought he was conversing with the devil himself. Um, this is ironic if read in light of the minister's black veil. All of us are covered in evil. All of us are enemies of God one with the devil in sin and rebellion. Um, on 255, again, the Brand character defines the unpardonable sin. Ethan Brand defines it. He says, It is a sin that grew within my own breast, replied Ethan Brand, standing erect with a pride that distinguishes all enthusiasts of his stamp. A sin that grew nowhere else. The sin of an intellect that triumphed over the sense of brotherhood with man and reverence for God and sacrificing everything to its own mighty claims. We see that own sin of intellect with, uh, with the birthmark. We see that same sin of intellect with uh, Dr. Faustus in uh, Christopher Marlowe's play. The only sin that deserves a recompense of immortal agony. Freely, were it to do again, would I incur the guilt? Unshrinkingly, I accept the retribution. Brand muses on his own transformation 
on 240, right at the end here. This will be my final note, I believe. Yeah, my final note here is on 240, 241. When they had gone, Ethan Brand sat listening to the crackling of the kindled wood and looking at the little spirits of fire that issued through the chinks of the door. These trifles, however, once so familiar, had but the slightest hold of his attention, while deep within his mind he was reviewing the gradual but marvelous change that had been wrought upon him by the search to which he had devoted himself. He remembered how the night dew had fallen upon him, how the dark forest had whispered to him, how the stars had gleamed upon him, a simple and loving man watching his fire in the years gone by, and ever musing as it burned. He remembered with what tenderness, with what love and sympathy for mankind, and what pity for human guilt and woe, he had first begun to contemplate those ideas which afterward became the inspiration of his life. With what reverence he had then looked into the heart of man, viewing it as a temple originally divine, and however desecrate, still to be held sacred by a brother. With what awful fear he had deprecated the success of his pursuit and prayed that the unpardonable sin might never be revealed to him. Then ensued the, that vast intellectual development, which in its progress disturbed the counterpoise between his mind and heart. The idea that possessed his life had operated as a means of education. It had gone on cultivating his powers to the highest point of which they were susceptible. This is where our connection with Dr. Faustus is. It had raised him from the level of an unlettered laborer to stand on a starlight eminence, within whether, whether the philosophers of the earth, laden with the lore of universities, might vainly strive to clamber after him. So much for the intellect, but where was the heart? That indeed had withered had contracted, had hardened, had perished. It had ceased to partake of the universal throb. He had lost his hold of the magnetic chain of humanity. He was no longer a brother man, opening the chambers or the dungeons of our common nature by the key of holy sympathy, which gave him a right to share in all its secrets. He was now a cold observer, looking on mankind as a subject of his experiment. This is the same place Dr. Faustus gets. I don't know if you remember this or not, but when Dr. Faustus has all that power, he uses men as part of his experiment, messing with them, um, teasing with them, ruining them, and at length converting man and woman to be his puppets, and pulling the wires that moved them to such degrees of crime as were demanded for his study. We have intellectual development without care for human connection, detached inhuman industrialization. In many ways we see here Nathaniel Hawthorne working again as a critique of the Industrial Revolution as it impacts and corrupts, corrodes, detaches men's hearts from community and, and, and isolates it in mere technological advance, advancements. We see in the same way Faustus's transformation from a seeker of knowledge to one who merely enjoys being the puppet master over others. And that's the end.